Um, so that was a little tune by a band called Opeth. It starts off all nicely and then goes a little bit less nice. Uh, and it's called The Lotus Eater. And the tenuous link to today is part of today, at least, is about eating unpleasant things. I don't know whether it's unpleasant to eat a lotus or not, uh, but uh, it's, it's probably not as nice as eating a flapjack. So, uh, that, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have any songs called The Testicle Eater, which is more in line with uh, what today is all about. Yes, today is about eating testicles. Fortunately, I'm not going to get any of you up here to eat a testicle. Uh, I mean, I mean chocolate. Anyway, so this is the... Um, went down a path there. I didn't intend to. Um, today we are go- is the penultimate lecture. So, you know, that's probably a good thing uh, in, in most of your heads. Um, next week's lecture involves a lot of chocolate. So uh, I thoroughly recommend coming to that one. Uh, you know, as my parting gift to you all, I bring a massive tub of chocolate. Um, but today, there's no chocolate, uh, but you're here nevertheless. And we're going to talk about repeated measures Anover. So we're still on the, uh, on the whole Anover theme. Uh, so there's nothing tremendously new. There's, there's a, a little bit of new stuff, but most of it is uh, revisiting familiar themes, like looking at F ratios and interpreting them and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, with the usual um, complement of t- testicles thrown in, because you would expect nothing less from your statistics lectures. So what are our learning outcomes today? We're going to, uh, hopefully, by the end of today and by the end of your practical class, you'll uh, know something about repeated measures de- designs and the benefits of them. You probably know some of that already because lots of you have used repeated measures designs in your uh, projects that you're doing. Um, we're going to have a look at one particular statistical problem that repeated measures designs throw up. Uh, throw up, I use the word advisedly in the context of the example. Uh, and then we'll have a look at two examples. So we'll have a look at a, a kind of a one-way repeated measures ANOVA where we've just manipulated one variable and also look at a factorial uh, repeated measures ANOVA as well. Just to give you a, a flavour of the, of basically how everything's pretty similar to what we've done before. So hopefully nothing, nothing too complicated. So we've seen before that the rationale for doing experiments is essentially to try to get at cause and effect. So in experiments, they're useful things because you can manipulate variables, and by manipulating variables in a systematic way, you can infer things about causality. So if you manipulate a predictor or an independent variable, and it has some effect on your outcome variable, then you can be pretty sure that the the effect it's had has been caused by the, the thing that you did, the manipulation that you made. Now, when we deal with repeated measures designs, all that's really changing is how we manipulate our variable. So up until now, we've looked at examples where we manipulated our independent variables using different groups of people. So one group of people, for example, our Viagra example, had a a placebo pill, whereas another group had um, a Viagra pill, and another group had a stronger dose of Viagra pill. Uh, With repeated measures designs, we're using the same people over and over again. So uh, that, I mean, if you wanted to take the Viagra example, that would mean like giving people a placebo pill for a couple of weeks and then maybe switching them to a Viagra pill. So this is around the, this this is a useful way for me to remind you that uh, this is the time of year when uh, you will be asked to fill out questionnaires about how your modules have gone and what you think of them. Um, which is a, it's a stressful time of year for us people delivering the modules because it's kind of it's reckoning time. Has our effort actually uh, been worth it? Or uh, are, are you all going to say this was a horrible, horrible module and uh, please sack the idiot at the front? Um, so it's quite a stressful time, especially you know, if, you're, uh, uh, if you have the kind of personality where you seek approval a lot. Um, so... Um, yeah. So anyway, so you'll be you'll be rating lecturers. Now you might want to know what affects those ratings. Okay. So we could take a group of lecturers. Uh, I have a that's my group of lecturers up there. Uh, and uh, what we might do is we might manipulate something about those lecturers to see whether it affects the kind of ratings they get. So our outcome is their ratings or some objective measure of their skills in delivering uh, in- intellectual. Is it intellectual? I don't know. Intellectual material. Um, and what we're going to manipulate is some aspect of those lecturers. So what we might do, for example, is take some lecturers uh, and under normal conditions just get them to deliver their lecture and then have you rate 
that, you know, those lectures. So they get a score that's maybe an average of all your ratings or something. So we have lots of lecturers, maybe 10 lecturers. They've all been rated, delivering their lecture in a normal way. So we've got some kind of baseline. Then what we might do at a separate point in time is to take the same group of lecturers. So note all these people are exactly the same as they were before. But now we remove their brains to see, does having a brain affect your ability to deliver an academic lecture? Now, I'm thinking in some cases it probably doesn't. But we'd need, you know, we're systematically testing it here. So we're manipulating some aspect of, of the lecturer, whether they have a brain or not. And we're seeing how that affects their lecturing skills. The important thing here is, as I say, we've got the same group of lecturers. So one of the advantages of this is we're controlling for lots of things. One important thing that we're controlling for is the, the kind of natural way that people deliver their lectures. So within, if you took a group of 10 lecturers, I mean, you, know, you have lots of different lectures from lots of different lecturers, and you've probably noticed that we're quite different in our styles of delivery. And, you know, I think that's a good thing because variety is the spice of life. And, uh, uh, but, you know, some, some lecturers are, are more traditional and, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at traditional. Uh, other lecturers, uh, you know, more animated, more enthusiastic. Some lecturers look like, you know, someone is literally holding their arm up behind their back, forcing them to give the lecture. You know, some lecturers may uh, cower behind the desk in fear. Who knows? But we all have slightly different skills. So, you know, I, because I get very anxious, I tend to be a bit more sweary because I swear when I'm anxious. And uh, also tend to mention testicles quite a lot more than other people probably do, I'm guessing. Um, so, but, you know, those differences will be kind of held constant over the two conditions, which is a good thing. So, you know, if you've got a kind of testicle kind of lecturer, they're going to be as testicle in one condition as they are in the other. So you're, you're balancing out these sort of individual differences in lecturing styles. So repeated measures are quite powerful because you can control a lot of things that might otherwise create sort of noise in your data. So what we're getting here is a very sensitive measure of whether brain removal affects our lecturing skills because we've controlled for you know, our, the, the, the normal way that we would approach a lecture. Are we extroverted, introverted, or all those sorts of things? But fundamentally, in terms of what we're doing, nothing changes, whether we're doing repeated measures or a between group, because we're still interested in looking at two types of variants. That's variants created by whatever it is we've manipulated. So how have lecturing skill scores been affected by having a brain or not? And that's what we, we call systematic variants. We've covered that before. And we'll also have some variants that's created by unknown factors. So things that we haven't measured, we haven't uh, accounted for, uh, it's just sort of noise that's there. The important thing is this unsystematic variance, this noise, in theory should be a bit smaller because by using the same participants in different conditions, we've held lots of things constant, like their gender and their IQ. Well, I guess their IQ would be affected by brain removal, I guess. Uh, but, you know, we've held lots of things constant, like their age and stuff like that. So our unsystematic variance should, hopefully, be uh, a bit smaller, which means that, in theory, you get a slightly more sensitive measure because you're reducing the amount of noise in the data by, uh, by using this, the, the same participants over multiple conditions. So this is one of the main benefits. You get increased sensitivity. So the unsystematic variance, in theory, should be reduced which gives you more sensitivity if you've got less error in, uh, in, in your uh, sort of outcome variable, then uh, you're, you have a, a better ability to detect the experimental effect. So essentially, there's less background noise uh, uh, with which to uh, kind of detect your experimental effect. So in theory, they're more sensitive, which is a good thing. However, uh, they're also more economical if you're paying participants or if you're you know, using participant time, uh, there are some benefits to, uh, to be had from, from an economic point of view as well. So repeated measures designs have a lot going for them. However, obviously there are some, some setbacks too. Uh, one of them is you could get practice effects. So in your memory experiments, for example, if you, uh, if you sort of got people to memorize lots of different word lists and then tested them and then another word list tested them, another word list tested them, Basically, they're getting practice at memorizing stuff. So by the time they get to the last experimental condition, 
They're a bit more familiar with what you're asking them to do. They may have guessed in advance what's going to happen to them. So you can get practice effects where people are just getting better at the task because they've been doing it for longer. And also, if you, uh, you know, if, say you had 10 experimental conditions and you were putting you know, some group of poor sods through all 10 experimental conditions, they're going to get quite fatigued by the end of it as well. So you know, the data you collect at the end of the experiment might not be very good because they're getting a bit knackered and a bit fed up of doing it. That can be, um, for example, if you do um, EEG studies where you're measuring uh, event-related potentials. Uh, sorry, you, you, you put electrodes on the head. I wasn't just randomly touching my head. Um, then you need like hundreds and hundreds of trials to get decent measures of ERPs. So fatigue can be an issue in those kinds of experiments where you're subjecting people to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trials and they're getting very bored. So you can introduce breaks uh, often in those sorts of ex like EEG or um, you know, physiology experiments where you're measuring GSR. You're quite often sort of programming little breaks so people can have a rest, you know, rest their eyes if, if, from watching the screen or whatever. And obviously if you want to get rid of uh, practice effects, you can counterbalance the different experimental conditions. So some people do the, the conditions in different orders to other people. And therefore, what you would hope is that the, the practice effects will sort of cancel out uh, across the different conditions. Because some people have done a condition first, other people have done it last. So on balance, those practice effects will cancel out. So there's a lot going through Peter Measures designs, and they're, they're used very frequently in psychology, which is why we're talking about them. And here is our example for today. Yeah, there's some good advice there. If you ever find yourself eating a testicle, um, don't think about it, <laughs> and it will all be fine. Uh, so that was a clip from uh, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, which um, this, I, I quite enjoy, actually. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not averse to a bit of trashy TV. After a hard day on the, on the forum answering questions about <laughs> homogeneity of variants. <laughs> It can be kind of soothing to know that there are people in Australia with worse lives than me um, <laughs> eating, eating testicles. Um, I do, I, well, I do. I don't watch it every year, but this year actually I've got back into it again. And I, um, I particularly like the Bush Tucker trial. I don't know, it's a bit sick, isn't it, really? But I do, I quite enjoy people that are so desperate for fame that they, they'll eat a, a kangaroo testicle. It just seems like I, I can't imagine a situation where I, well, apart from maybe, maybe if someone was going to like, you know, was holding my wife hostage or something, I might eat, well, I know I would, I would definitely eat a kangaroo testicle to get her back, but that's love, that's love for you. <laughs> but there's not many situations where I would think, yeah, okay, I'll have a go. Um, so I kind of, I don't know, it's perverse, I know, but I kind of enjoy it. So uh, this example is around the Bush Tucker trial. So... I'm just kind of interested because they, they eat lots of different things. It's not just testicles. And um, I wondered whether there were differences in, in sort of how uh, unpleasant those experiences were. So what I decided to do in my hypothetical world was to uh, take four different uh, Bush Tucker delights and to feed them to uh, a group of eight celebrities. So the first one I took was a witchetty grub, which uh, I, I haven't seen on this series, but they, they may have been there. People often think that witchetty grubs are, are stupid, thick animals uh, that deserve to be eaten, but they're quite clever. Like this one, for example, you can see is doing some trigonometry. Um, <laughs> so, you know, don't eat them. They're, they're very intelligent beings. Uh, this is a kangaroo testicle uh, in, its, in its pouch. 
Nice. Um, it's kind of kind of hairy, as you can see. Uh, there's also, ooh, I wonder. If, hang on, I'll get I'll get my pen thing going. Hopefully, if you look at this thing here, that's a, that's a kangaroo penis <laughs> as well. Which um, I, again, I don't know if they've used the kangaroo penis this year, but they are very they seem very elastic indeed. Uh, I, I remember, I think it was last year, someone was eating, you know, like literally, it was like stretching out here. <laughs> And um, I just kept thinking of Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four. <laughs> anyway, um, right, this is a uh, stick insect. This, this really, when they eat stick insects, it really grosses me, it grosses me out. I don't, I'm not a big fan of, well, I'm not a big fan of insects generally, uh, but stick insects in particular, I don't, yeah. When, the, when they sort of put them in whole and they're still alive, I just think, Ugh. Uh, Sorry, I'm just vicariously learning you all disgust issues anyway um so yeah there's a stick insect it's a that's a great photo uh the man looks suspiciously like he's kind of thinking he can just ignore the fact there's a stick insect on his head and maybe it will just go away if he just looks into the distance for a while uh if that was me i yeah i'd, I'd be i'd be running screaming if you ever want some fun throw a stick insect at me and watch my reaction and this is Brighton's very own uh, Katie Price, as she's now known, I believe, um, from uh, many years ago, eating a fish eye. Um, it's not a pleasant picture, but I take comfort from the fact that given she's been married to Peter Andre and that kickboxing bloke, she's almost only had worse stuff in her mouth than a <laughs> fish eye. Anyway, so are these bush tucker foods more revolting than others? So we've got eight celebrities. We fed them four foods, so they all ate all of the foods, but we would have counterbalanced it, so some of them would have eaten the stick insect first, others would have had the testicle first, and so on and so forth. And our outcome is simply the time to retch. So how long did it take them to go, well, um, Helen thingy my bob on the video, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was a brilliant retch. She was just, <laughs> uh, So how long did it take them to make that first kind of gagging, retching, reflex in seconds. This is a great lecture for nine o'clock in the morning. I'm just, I'm feeling glad I didn't have a witch grub for breakfast. So we've got some data. So uh, just to, oh, the pen thing is working today. So we've got our eight celebrities here and all of them have eaten all four of the animals. And what we've got for each one is a time, for example, eight seconds, which it took before they retched. So uh, celebrity number one, when they were the stick insect, whole eight seconds before the kind of reaction. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. So for this uh, celebrity, celebrity number one, there is variability in how quickly they retched. So for the fish eye, for example, they retched very quickly. So one second, it just took one second. Once the eye had burst in their mouth, the retching commenced. Uh, whereas for others, like the stick insect and the testicle, they weren't too bad. They lasted a whole eight or uh, seven seconds before retching. So there's variance within a person. So this is, this is what we've got here. So we've got variance within a person. Now what we're interested in is how much of that variance is due to the, the sort of you know, internal uh, constitution of that person and how much of that variance has been created by the fact that we've given them different animals to eat. So if you imagine, you know, if we gave them a s four stick insects to eat, there shouldn't be any variance. Their, their retching time should be pretty similar uh, on all of the four occasions. So the fact there is some variance, some of that will be created by the fact we've given them different animals to eat. Now we can look at individual differences in a way. So uh, let's have a look at celebrity six. They have a lot less variability. So if you look at the variance in their, in their retching times is really quite small compared to some of the other celebrities. So they were really fairly unaffected by which animals they ate. If you look at their, their times, they vary between just five and seven. So very, very small variability in their retching times. They were pretty consistent. Regardless of what animal we, we asked them to eat, uh, they, they took a similar amount of time before gagging. So, like I say, what we're interested in, we've, we've got this sort of variability within each participant, and we want to try to decompose that into how much of it has been created by our experimental manipulation, giving people different animals, and how much of it is just due to their, their sort of you know, nat natural uh, constitution. 
so you know some of them may be uh, particularly uh, disgust sensitive and you know they might be really affected by certain animals more than others so you know may, maybe the you know the more um, like witch tea grubs I seem to remember them being quite explosive like when you when you bite into them there's a lot of goo so maybe like the fish eye and the witch tea grub will really affect people who are disgust sensitive I think a testicle would maybe disgust sensitivity isn't the best example to use but anyway, you get my point. If you don't like gooey stuff, maybe the, the, the more gooey, explosive things will, would affect you more than the, you know, the more sort of chewy, sinewy things like testicles. Uh, anyway, my point is, I do have one. Down the bottom here, we've got a mean within each condition. So on average, across the eight celebrities, the stick insect, there was about an eight second delay before gagging. For the testicle and fish eye, more like a four second gap. And the witch de grub about, uh, well, just under a six second gap. So they're the means we're comparing. So in a sense, it's, it's no different to uh, the other designs that we've looked at because we just are comparing those four means. There's a difference in how we've collected the data and there's a difference in how we're, we're going, or the mass behind it is slightly different. But essentially, we're doing the same thing. We're comparing four means across four conditions. The only difference is we've got the same people in each condition. So what you get out of the ANOVA is basically pretty similar. It's what's going on behind the scenes that's a little bit different. So what is going on behind the scenes? Well, we don't need to know too much about it. Uh, all I will do, as I have done for things like ANCOVA, is not get into the nitty gritty of it. If you're that interested, you can uh, read the textbook chapter. Um, but I just want to point out, we've got some total variability in the, uh, the retching times. And we partition that into two. We've done this a lot. Now, the big difference in what's going on behind the scenes is that that first partitioning is, slightly, is done slightly differently to in an independent design. The main difference being that we split the variability into variability within participants. So that's the kind of how much variance is created within a person. So you know we have those, those variances uh, for each person. It's kind of looking at that. It's saying how much, how much sort of difference within a person is there in their retching times. <laughs> And then we also take out the variance between individuals. So that would be, on the previous slide, looking at, say, the fact that one person's variance was 0.92, because their scores are quite similar, whereas celebrities one, Celebrity 1's variance was, I think, 9 point something. So that's how we split it out. We split it out according to the, the variance within individuals and the variance between individuals. Essentially, the variance between individuals, we're not we're not particularly interested in. All that's going to tell us is, you know, are some people more, uh, more hardened than others or are some people less affected by the experiment than others? What we're interested in is the variance within individuals. So like I said, like for participant one, we're interested in that sort of, that variance of nine. And what we want to do is break that down to see what of it, you know, how much of that nine for that person is due to the experimental effect and how much of it is due to unexplained factors that we haven't measured. So we've just got a sort of a, an extra step in the partitioning, but the main thing, the take home message is that ultimately we still end up in the same position of, of working out a model sum of squares and a residual sum of squares, and the model sum of squares represents the effect of the experiment, so how much are the, are the mean retching times, how much have uh, they been influenced by, by the fact that you're eating different animals, and the error of sum of squares is just telling us you know, how much of the, the difference in retching times is explained by things we haven't <laughs> measured or manipulated. So we end up, our F ratio is exactly the same. We're just comparing, essentially, the, the experimental effect against the background noise. It's just how, how we get to that stage is different. But SPSS gets to that stage for you, so you don't need to worry too much about it. So the other thing we need to be aware of is there is a slight problem when we analyze repeated measures designs. Which is, you might remember uh, from uh, way back when we uh, were looking at bias, um, I briefly mentioned that there's an assumption of independence. So scores should be, or scores across conditions should be independent from each other. So in other words, your, your sort of scores in your witch grub condition should be independent from your scores in the uh, kangaroo testicle condition. Now, Hopefully, reasonably self-evidently, if you use different participants in different conditions, that independence is kind of a given. So, you know, unless your participants are telepathic in some way, 
your scores in your Wichity Club condition ought not to be affected by your scores in the kangaroo uh, testicle condition if you've used different people. But also, hopefully reasonably self-evident, if you've used the same people, there will be some dependency. Because, for example, you know, if, you, if you have a very solid constitution and you can eat anything, then uh, you know, your, your retching time should be relatively low. Uh, no, sorry, relatively high. It takes you a long time to retch in all four conditions. Whereas if you're someone who's kind of really a bit squeamish, then your retching times will be really quick in the conditions. So, so constitutional factors will affect your retching times and therefore your scores across conditions will correlate. If you, if you retch really quickly to a witchy grub, you're more likely to retch really quickly to uh, a fish eye, for example. So we, we, in repeater measures designs, we basically violate this assumption of independence. That's pretty much guaranteed that we do. So this is the problem. Why is it a problem? Well, essentially, it uh, makes the F ratio inaccurate. So the reason, or not the reason, but one of the, one of the things required for the F ratio to, to be accurate and to have the distribution that we know that it ought to have, we have to have independent scores. In repeated measures designs, we don't have independent scores, so the F ratio is not accurate, therefore we can't sort of trust the p-values from it. So how do we get around this? So the fact we violate this assumption in repeated measures designs, it's not something you really have to test for as such, it's just it's a given that you will. Um, how do we get around it? Well, we get around it by making a different assumption, essentially. And um, I don't know how much everyone loves assumptions, so I bet you can't wait to hear about another one. Uh, but there's another one, and it's called sphericity. Now, the reason it's called sphericity is because if you have an assumption, you have to give it a slightly awkward name that's difficult to pronounce and spell, like heteroscedasticity, for example. Um, sphericity is not quite as bad, but obviously when, you know, when someone was coming up with all of this, they thought, well, you know, we, we better call it something a bit tricky. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get city in there again, like heteroscedasticity. You know, it's got to have a city in there. And, well, we'll put some spheres in there. Spheres are good. So there we have it. Spherical city. Sphericity. Um, now, what does sphericity mean? Well, there's, uh, I, I normally try to explain this on two levels, because there's, there's a very simple way to understand it that's not strictly accurate. And then there's a strictly accurate way to understand it, which uh, is not so easy to understand. So I normally start off with the, the sort of ballpark thing, uh, which, you know, if, if you get that, you know, that, that's not too bad. And then I move on to the, the slightly more technically accurate definition um, and with the hope that some, some people might go from one to the other. So very crudely put, all sphericity means is the correlation across conditions ought to be the same. So in other words... If you took the correlation between the scores in the witch grub and kangaroo testicle conditions, the correlation that you get ought to be pretty similar to uh, what you would get if you, say, took the correlation between the witch grub scores and the fish eye condition. So all this means is really that the dependency between scores is pretty similar across the different conditions. So it's not the case that, like, your witch grub and your kangaroo testicle are really, really dependent scores, you know, they're really highly correlated, but your fish eye and uh, your um, witch grub, for example, are not very highly correlated. So it's just saying that the dependency is kind of the same across conditions. So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the, the ballpark kind of definition of sphericity. It means that the correlation between treatment levels is roughly the same. The more specific and technically accurate definition is that if you were to take the differences between conditions, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'll show you uh, a table in a minute. Uh, so if you took the difference between scores of, uh, of all the conditions that you have, then the variances of those, of those differences ought to be the same. So sphericity is a bit like homogeneity of variance in a way, but it's homogeneity of variance when you look at the differences between conditions rather than the conditions themselves. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that in a bit more detail in the next slide. From a practical point of view, even if you don't understand what sphericity is, uh, just like with homogeneity of variance where you can use Levine's test, you can look at sphericity using something called Morchley's test. And it's a very similar principle to Levine's in that if it's significant, then the assumption of sphericity is violated. If it's not significant, then the assumption is met. Like any significance test, You've got to be a bit wary. If your sample is huge, then you can quite often get 
uh, you know, apparent violations of sphericity that, you know, where actually you haven't really violated it too much at all. It's just that because you've got a big sample size, your test has, has been very, very sensitive to kind of a small, a small deviation from sphericity. And likewise, if you've got very small samples, you need to be wary that you might get a non-significant, um, yeah, non-significant Morchley's test when actually you've got a big violation of sphericity. So you've always got to interpret these tests within the context of your sample size. So going back to the what is sphericity. So here is a table of differences. So this is uh, the testicle condition uh, versus the stick insect. Best, best stick I can manage with that pen. So what we've done here is literally take the score for celebrity one. So celebrity one, we've taken the difference between the retching time for the testicle and the retching time for the stick insect. And that difference was minus one. Then we've also looked at uh, taking the difference between the fish eye and the stick insect. So that's taking their retching time on the fish eye and subtracting from it their retching time on the stick insect. That's the difference of minus seven. So there was a seven second dip or minus seven second difference in their retching time between those two animals. Now we've done the same for the witchetty grub and the stick. And for that participant, there's a difference of minus two. Uh, then the same for the eye and the testicle. Uh, that's a difference of minus six. Same for the witchetty. And the witchetty and the testicle are looking a bit similar there. Uh, that's a difference of minus one. And finally, the witchetty and the eye. Now, you, you don't ever have to do this. I'm only showing you this to illustrate what sphericity is all about. So for each participant, we've worked out those differences. So we're not dealing with the raw scores. We're dealing with the differences between conditions. And then what we do is we work out, so we've done that for all eight participants, and we get a variance in those scores of, say, in, in the first, for the first set of differences, 5.27. The assumption of sphericity is basically we assume that these values down the bottom are roughly the same. That's all it is. So if you take the, the, the differences in scores between all the conditions, work out the variance for each of those columns of differences, then the values you get for the variance should be the same uh, uh, in, each, in each of those sort of, uh, columns of differences. So even from, like I say, you, 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 don't, you wouldn't ever actually do this. I'm just showing you to explain it. Um, you can see here very clearly we, shouldn't, we have violated sphericity because we've got a variance here of like five and then up here we've got a variance of 26. So that's, you know, that's like four or five times bigger than uh, the... Well, those two variances are sort of a magnitude of five different from each other. So in all likelihood, when we do our Morchley's test, we'll probably find that we violated sphericity because there are some differences here in the variances. For these conditions, they're pretty small. Uh, for these two conditions, they're, they're pretty big. So that's what sphericity is. Now what happens is you can measure it. So what Morchley's test is doing is it's measuring the degree to which we have sphericity. And basically, you get a measure that uh, at its maximum value is 1. 1 means that you have perfect sphericity in your data, so no problem at all. And at the other end of the scale, um, you could, the lowest value it can possibly be is 1 divided by the number of groups you have minus 1. So we've got four groups, so the lowest value we could get here is 1 divided by 4 minus 1, 1 divided by 3, a third. That would mean a really severe violation of sphericity. So they're the, the sort of boundaries within which you're working. One means no problem at all, and one divided by the number of groups minus one is the lowest, the lowest possible value you can have. That's what's known as the lower bound estimate. So that's one over k minus one. K is the number of groups. So what you get is a, a greenhouse geyser estimate and a, something known as a hewn felt estimate. The, they're just different ways of computing the, uh, the degree of sphericity that you have. So if these values are one, happy days. If those values are less than one, then possibly unhappy days, but it depends how different from one they are. And that's what Morchley's test is testing, essentially. It's testing how different from one they are. 
Now, you might wonder, if you violated Sophisticity, what you do? Well, it's actually very straightforward. SPSS does it for you. You don't really have to think very much at all. Um, it uses these estimates to correct the degrees of freedom. So it will take the greenhouse geyser estimate and it will multiply the degrees of freedom by that estimate. So if sphericity is met, then your estimates will be 1, so it will times the degrees of freedom by 1, and they'll stay the same. However, if you've got a violation from sphericity, the, value, the estimate will be less than 1, so you'll be timesing your degrees of freedom by a value less than 1, so they will get smaller. And by getting smaller, it makes it harder for the F ratio to be significant. So it's, it's just correcting for the, the degree to which you violated sphericity. If you haven't violated it very much at all, you won't get very much of a correction. If you violated it a lot, you'll get a lot more of a correction. You might ask which, because there's two different, you know, two different versions, which one you use. Well, in general, if you want a sort of guaranteed sort of correction that will always correct nicely, uh, but it's slightly conservative, then use greenhouse geyser. So it's kind of a bit stricter, uh, and the Hume felt is, in general, at slightly more liberal. 99 out of 100 times, it won't make any difference which one you pick in terms of whether you decide an effect is significant or not. Uh, in some of the examples I generate, it does make a difference, but that's just because I like to generate awkward data to illustrate points. But in practical terms, I, I, you'd be really hard pushed to... to generate a scenario where they would give you a different result. So how is green get, green, the greenhouse geyser estimate calculated? Well, basically, it uses this equation. It's, uh, you know, it's really straightforward. Um, why am I showing you this equation? Because clearly, I would never want you to use it. Clearly, I would never want to use it myself. Who would want to use that? It's, you know, it's... It's a bit like wanting to use uh, a stick with nails sticking out of it uh, as a comb for your head or something. It's just, why would you do it? It's horrible. So the reason I'm putting this up is because I think normally by about this time in the course, although it could have possibly been you know, 10 weeks ago, um, you're probably getting pretty sick of SPSS. You've all been working very hard on your portfolios. SPSS has probably been driving you absolutely nuts, and you're thinking, why do we have to do this? Can I throw the computer out of the window? No, I can't, because Sussex has bloody well tied them down with things. <laughs> so I just have to headbutt the desk instead. And what I, what I want you to appreciate is if SPSS didn't exist or you know, things similar to it, if you wanted to calculate the greenhouse gas correction, you would have to use this equation and you know, an abacus or something. And imagine how unpleasant that would be. It would be almost as unpleasant as the witch de grub uh, feast. So... I put this here to tell you one thing, which is SPSS is your friend. <laughs> and you should show it some love, because it saves you having to deal with stuff like that. And I think this is a useful time for that message to uh, be imparted. Right, so correcting for sphericity. So you get this Morchley's test. So this is Morchley's test for the, witch, the Bush Tucker example. So we've got one effect, one thing we've manipulated, which is the type of animal. And we look at Morchley's test, it has a p-value less than 0.05, so it's significant. So we know we're going to have to use one of the corrections. So this is basically how you go through it. Morchley's test, if it's significant, right, I need to use a correction. If it's not significant, you think, right, I don't need to use a correction. So what it does, these are the degrees of freedom for this effect, for the effect of animal. And all it will do is it takes these values here and it multiplies the degrees of freedom. So degree of freedom of 3 gets multiplied by 0.5, so it basically more or less halves. For the Hume felt, that value of 3 gets multiplied by 0.666, that was purely coincidental. Um, so you know, that goes from 3 to being about 2, so it's getting smaller. And finally, the lower bound, which you'd never really use, to be perfectly honest, uh, is a third, because we have four conditions, so it's one divided by three. You can also correct using that, and that takes your degrees of freedom from being three down to being one. And it will do the same with the other degrees of freedom, the 21 degrees of freedom. So you get a greenhouse geyser correction, it just basically halves it. So it's taking you know, the degree to which you violate sphericity, and it's reducing the degrees of freedom accordingly. If you use the Hume felt, it again goes down, but by not quite so much. 
And the lower bound, it will go down tons because that's the lowest possible sort of theoretical value you could have for the data that you've got. So in real terms, what does this mean? Well, you get an output like this from SPSS, and it looks a bit more hideous than um, the ones that you've seen before. And basically, you know, you get four Fs instead of one F, which might seem a bit kind of pointless. But notice, the Fs are all the same. So they're the same value, but all that changes is these degrees of freedom. So if we assume sphericity, if Mortis' test was non-significant, we could just look at the top row and ignore everything else in the table. But if it is, if Mortis' test is significant as it is here, we need to decide whether to use either Greenhouse Geyser or Hewn Felt. So all it, the only difference it makes is which row of the table you look at. And you can see, because the degrees of freedom change, so do the p-values. So if we assume sphericity, which we can't do in this case, we get a nice significant effect. If we correct, uh, you know, because I've fudged these data to be awkward, uh, if we use a greenhouse geyser correction, you can see we get a just about non-significant effect. It's 0.06. If we use Hume felt, uh, you get a just significant effect of 0.048. So why... If you ever got into this situation, what would you do? Well, you'd probably, uh, well, you'd, you'd either use Greenhouse Geyser to be conservative or you'd take an average between the two p-values. You can do that as well. And there are some other, more in your handout, there are some slightly more sophisticated rules that you can apply if you want to. The main point to take home here, though, the, the reason I put the p-values to, to come out just above or just below 0.05 is just to show how utterly pointless it is to use 0.05 as a criterion for significance. Because clearly the effect is the same, whatever we do, uh, and it's just, you know, one correction or another makes a difference between a sort of a huge categorical decision that we make between saying, yes, this effect is worth interpreting versus, no, this effect is not worth interpreting. So this, the, the whole, well, I, you know, I've talked about this before, uh, the whole 0.05 thing is a, a bit, it can lead you into very sort of black and white thinking about things. So... We can interpret the main effect if we were to decide it was significant, which we might not do if we were looking at the greenhouse geyser correction, uh, using you know, post-hoc tests as normal. So this is a graph of uh, the retching times. You can see retching times are a lot longer for the stick inset. That seems like the, the least disgusting of the four. But we would have to apply some post-hoc tests. There are built-in contrasts in SPSS, which you can apply, which are, are very similar to the, the ones that you would have used last week in the two-way ANOVA. But you can also do post-hoc tests. There's, uh, there are some limited options in SPSS. Um, the, the only built-in ones that you can really do are something known as Chuki's least significant difference, which doesn't correct for the number of tests at all, and I wouldn't use that ever. The Bonferroni method, which we've talked about before and which you've used before, which is out of the three available ones, that's probably the best one to use. Uh, but you can use a method very similar to the Bonferroni method known as the SIDAC method, which is a bit less strict than Bonferroni. But essentially, you're, you know, they're your options for following up the ANOVA. So what about factorial ANOVA? We've got a slightly different example uh, to do with speed dating. So this is the old... Uh, the old conundrum of whether looks or personality are more important. So what I did was I manipulated this by setting up a speed dating situation where uh, we had nine stooges. So there were nine people that everyone dated or had, had their five minutes with. And those stooges varied in their levels of attractiveness. They were either attractive, averagely attractive or ugly. And they varied in their personality. They were either highly charismatic, sort of averagely charismatic or completely dull. And the dependent variable was the ratings of the people who dated them. So in this particular scenario, all of the stooges were males and all of the people doing the speed dating were heterosexual females. So they could give them a rating from zero, which is like, you know, please buy me a plane ticket so I can leave the country and never see this person again, to kind of a hundred, which is like, whoa, this is, this is my ideal person. I want to marry them now. So this is how it's set up. Our stooges, they could either be highly attractive. Brad Pitt, in my head, is, is the archetype, prototypical attractive male. Don't know what that says. Uh, that's an averagely attractive male. That's a composite face. That person doesn't actually exist. That is actually what an averagely attractive male looks like. And uh, that's an ugly male. <laughs> Bit harsh, I know. 
And also, they could vary in their charisma. So they could be highly charismatic. Um, at the time I did this lecture, I obviously considered Russell Brand to be a charismatic person. My view may have changed. Um, an averagely a, a charismatic person again, and uh, a dull person. Stats lecturer, maybe. So what we're doing is we're just manipulating the levels of attractiveness and charisma across all of these conditions. So we've got nine dates that people can have and nine dates that people rate. So the question is, how are those ratings affected by charisma and looks? So in our spreadsheet, this is a repeated measures condition. Every woman participant goes to every table and has a five minute conversation with every one of those potential dates and gives them a rating. So our first participant, for example, they uh, gave out our highly charismatic, highly attractive date a rating of 89 out of 100, uh, but gave the uh, ugly dullard a rating of 52 out of 100. So, you know, this is basically how the, how the data will be laid out in SPSS. We get our sphericity test. Now, when we have a factorial ANOVA, the thing I want to draw your attention to is we get lots of Morchley's tests. We get them for each of our potential independent variables. So one for looks, one for charisma, and also one for the interaction. And we'd be trying to interpret whether uh, they are significant. The only one that is, is the interaction effect. So the looks by charisma interaction has violated sphericity. So for that one and that one only, we need to use a correction. What do we get out of the ANOVA? We get this. Hideosity. That's a horrible table. You're going to look at that and fear for your lives. But we actually only have to look at a very small number of things in it. So if I do this, the table becomes a bit more manageable. So for our effect of looks, we can assume sphericity because of Morchley's test was non-significant. So we can ignore the other rows. For our effect of charisma, we could, uh, our Morchley test was non-significant. So we only need to look at sphericity assumed. And for our interaction effect, there we did have a problem with sphericity, so we, we ignore the sphericity assumed column and interpret one of the two corrections. And like I said, in this case, it makes no difference, so, uh, as will often be the case. So we basically got a significant effect of looks, just like when we did factorial and over last week, a significant effect of charisma and a significant effect of the interaction. The other thing to note is that each effect has its, a, a unique error degrees of freedom. So when we're reporting looks, we'd use 2 and 18 degrees of freedom. For charisma, it's 2 and 18. And for looks by charisma, we'd have to report these corrected degrees of freedom. And again, they have their, their own unique error degrees of freedom. Andy, can I just ask you, would you report one or both? Uh, you'd only ever do one. Normally, Greenhouse Geyser is the thing that people use. <clears throat> if it makes no difference to what, how you're going to interpret it, I would always go for Greenhouse Geyser. So our main effects of looks, pretty easy to interpret, massively significant effect, and it looks as though you've got a sort of a nice linear trend there of just the uglier the date got, the worse their ratings got. Now, again, you'd have to do some post-op tests to see exactly which conditions were different from each other, but you know, it's, a, it's a fair bet that, at the very least, uh, these two conditions are different. So if you're you know, ugly, or ugly, you'll get worse ratings than if you're attractive. But bear in mind that this is ignoring how charismatic people were. So this ugly condition, it contains charismatic dates and non-charismatic dates and, and all the rest of it. What's the effect of personality? Well, it's pretty similar. It's a bit more pronounced, but again, it looks like a linear trend. The, the lower your charisma level, so as charisma sort of falls, uh, your ratings get lower as well. So highly charismatic dates. <coughs> Bear in mind, this is the whole group, so it's containing the, the ugly dates and the attractive dates. Get much higher ratings than the uh, ones with no charisma. Again, you'd have to do some postdoc tests if you wanted to pick that apart. However, because we got significant interaction, those main effects are not particularly what we're interested in. What we're interested in is what combined effect these two variables have. So let's have a look. First of all, our highly charismatic dates. So we've got our highly charismatic dates, and we're looking at how their ratings are affected by their looks. And the answer is they're not very affected at all. Those means are all basically the same. 
So if you are a highly charismatic person, it doesn't matter whether you're attractive, average looking or ugly, you'll get good ratings. Your personality will, will carry you through. That's kind of, you know, that's, that's the important thing. However, if you're averagely charismatic, then your ratings are quite substantially affected by how good looking you are. So if you're sort of, you know, an average, an average kind of person, then your ratings will be pretty high if you're attractive, but they'll be much lower if you're ugly. So if you've, you know, basically, if you're averagely charismatic and you're ugly, try and increase your uh, uh, ch charisma levels, and that would be a good thing to do, assuming you want to get a good rating from dates. What about no charisma? Well, if you've got no charisma at all, then basically your ratings, again, just like with high charisma, are unaffected by how attractive you are. You'll get low ratings across the board. So if you're a complete dullard, it doesn't matter if you do look like Brad Pitt, you'll still get a low rating because you're dull. So that's what the interaction is basically telling us. So the, the only level of charisma where attractiveness makes a difference is if you're averagely charismatic. And um, like I say, that's kind of it's the interaction that's more interesting than uh, the main effects per se. So it seems that you know, in a way, personality is is more important than looks. But if your average, if your personality is kind of average, then looks are sort of important. By the way, it's completely made up, so don't don't take that as a life message. So repeated measures designs, basically what you're doing is kind of the same as any other design. You're just looking at an F-ratio for each effect that you have, whether it's a, a one-way or a factorial. The extra thing you need to worry about is sphericity. Have a look at Morchley's test. If it's significant, then sphericity can't be assumed and use greenhouse Geiser corrected values um, or, or Hume felt. But like I say, the default should probably be greenhouse Geiser. Uh, if, if Morchley's test is not significant, then you can assume sphericity and then you just look at the top sphericity assumed row for each effect. If you want to do follow-up tests, uh, you can't do planned contrasts in SPSS. You have to do the built-in ones that you looked at last week in your practical class. And there are a limited set of post hoc tests you can do for the main effects as well.